All right. This is the Sunday previous to the infamous Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision which legalized abortion on demand. And for the most part, I would venture to say that probably 90% of the churches in America did not say a word about it in their services this morning. Abortion is without a doubt America's national holocaust. We sing the song, God Bless America. How can God bless a nation that legally, deliberately, with the, with the support, the tacit support, of the vast majority of Christians in this country murder tens of millions of babies? I want to give you a few scriptures and talk a little bit about this matter of life. Take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. Under the Mosaic law, if men strive and hurt a woman with, what? Child, a pregnant woman. In the scripture, it's called a woman with child. It's not a blob of tissue. It's not a product of conception. It's a child. If a man strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, she goes into labor and delivers the baby and yet no mischief follow the baby survives he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine you know there were no jails in the Old Testament incarceration is a fairly recent form of punishment when you go back into antiquity. Uh, in the Old Testament, the punishment was mostly uh, adjudicated by the victim's family. So a man physically harms this woman with child, but the baby lives, survives the premature birth, so the punishment will be decided by the woman's husband. That was the law of Moses. But look at verse 23. And if any mischief follow, meaning the baby died, he hurt the child in the womb in such a way that caused the death of the child. Then thou shalt give, what? Life for life. Life for life. You kill the unborn child, you forfeit your own life. Life for life. So in the Old Testament, God is very clear in the law of Moses that the unborn child is a living soul de deserving all of the legal protections given to human beings the law adjudicated for the purpose of defending life and the unborn child under the law of Moses was recognized as a, as a living person just as much as any person born Look at Luke chapter, well, no, let's go to uh, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. We'll go to Luke in a minute. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the oxygen.
Because there are, there are some that even call themselves Christians who teach that a baby is not a living soul until it's delivered from the womb, separated from the umbilical cord, and draws its first breath. And they use that verse of scripture, and God created man, a living soul, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And they use that to mean, well, whenever the baby draws that first breath, then it's a human being. Now, we already know that's not true because of what Exodus said. Correct? Life for life in the womb. So we know that God determines life as being inside the womb. Life doesn't begin when it draws its first breath with its lungs. The life of the flesh is in the what? Blood. Blood. When blood is formed in the little baby embryo, the soul has been formed. Life has been given. When is blood formed in the embryo? At the moment of conception. At the moment of conception, that little child, that undeveloped life, has its own unique and distinct blood. It is not the blood of the mother. The blood was produced inside the embryo when the male sperm was united with the female egg and at the moment of conception blood was formed in that little body. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So when blood is in the flesh, life is in the flesh. Can I get an amen on that? You understand that? You see that? So life begins at conception. Look at Luke chapter 1. Let's go to the New Testament and show an example of how the New Testament scripture relates to this subject. Luke chapter 1 and verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, has been impregnated by the Holy Spirit. She is carrying the Christ child in her womb. Elizabeth, her cousin, who's much older, has had a miraculous conception in the sense that her, her and her husband were both up in years and unable to bear children naturally. God opened the womb of Elizabeth, and she's now carrying John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. Mary takes that little journey to visit with Elizabeth, her cousin, to fellowship because the angel had told her that she was pregnant with John. And so that's what brings her to Elizabeth's home. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation, the greeting of Mary, the what? Babe. Everybody say it. Babe or baby leaped in her womb. The baby leaped in her womb. The Holy Spirit called the unborn John the Baptist a baby. Now notice by comparison, look at verse 44. For as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe again leaped in my womb. This is the same Greek word, by the way, that is used in the scriptures in the English translation, child. For example, in verse 80, and the child grew. In the, in the eyes of God and in the articulation of the language that God used to deliver the New Testament in the Greek language, he used the same word 
to describe an unborn child as he used to describe a born child. There was no distinction in the language that was used. Unborn child is a child. A, a born child is a child. Both are living souls. And then one more passage, Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. This is one of the most precious passages relative to life in the womb in all of the scripture. Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13. Look how David describes this. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. David is describing the relationship that he had with his creator while he was still in the womb of his mother. Look at this. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee, the substance of his body, when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth, an analogy to the womb. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being un imperfect, even while I was not completely developed while my my fingers and toes and my extremities were not completely developed whenever my body was not completely developed thou saw me in thy book all my members my all my bodily members were written which in continuance were fashioned as, as the baby developed, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. God, David is saying, when I was in the womb, even before my body was completely developed, unformed, you saw me. You took note of me. You covered me. You loved me. You had a relationship with me even before I left my mother's womb. Is that precious? David understood the sovereignty of God. David, David was responding to the love of God and the uniqueness in the way that God loved him as an individual, even in the, uh, the womb of his mother. I don't think there's any question that the Bible in both Testaments makes it very, very clear that unborn babies are living human beings that actually have a relationship with their creator even before they are fully developed, even before they are born. God knows them individually, uniquely. He knows their members. He knows how many hairs will be on their head. He knows what color their eyes and their hair will be. He knows what kind of a personality they will possess as they grow into uh, maturity. He knows everything about them. He created them in his image and in his likeness and in the womb of the mother. Even there, God is our God. If you're going to clap, clap. Imagine. This leads us to, of course, the first major point that I'd like to leave with you today, and that is that children are a gift of God. Children are a gift of God. I often hear people talk about children being accidents. 
Well, they might be accidents as far as human beings are concerned, but there's no accidents as far as God is concerned. God gives children as gifts. Psalm 127, verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb his reward. Children are the heritage of the Lord. Psalm 22 and verse 10, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art, listen to this, thou art my God from my mother's belly. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. I've told you before that you're looking at a miracle baby. Because my mother was told by the doctors that she would never have a child. That biologically, she could not have a child. And from the time that she was first told that, and the time that she was almost 40 years of age, the doctors were right. But a few years before my mother turned 40, she married my father. And my father was a converted alcoholic. And he prayed and asked God for five years. He prayed and asked God to give him a son. And he prayed that that little boy would grow up and be a preacher. And five years after that prayer was started, guess what happened? At the age of 40, the young, tender age of 40, my mother conceived me in her womb. The doctor said that couldn't happen, but it did. Children are a heritage of the Lord. From the womb, he is our God. Ruth chapter 4 and verse 3, the Bible says, And the Lord gave her conception. That's an important verse because when you try to explain life biologically, medically, scientifically, you come up with more questions than you do answers. So we all know that conception occurs whenever a male sperm unites with a female egg, but there are multiple millions of times that the male sperm will unite with the female egg and there will be no conception take place. In fact, most of the times, conception does not take place. But millions and millions and millions of contact between that male sperm and that female egg and nothing happens. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, from that male sperm and that female egg come conception. Well, why didn't conception come all those other millions of times? Why did that not produce a baby? The Lord gave conception. The Lord gave conception. The Lord decides when conception will occur in that great scientific, biological interaction between the, the male and the female. God alone decides when life will result and conception will occur. And the Lord gave her conception. Anytime a, a woman conceives a child, God gave that conception to her. No matter what the circumstances were or weren't, the Lord gave conception. Life is a gift of God. The role of government, the proper role of government, is to protect the lives and the liberties of the citizens within that land. It is not the government's job 
to supply our health care from cradle to grave. It's not the government's job to bail out the big bankers who are, quote, too big to fail. I don't know how many of you are paying attention to the news here lately or not, but in that so-called cromnibus bill that just passed, you know, that, that Mr. Bonner was so excited to help Mr. Obama with, and they passed that $1.1 trillion cromnibus bill. I don't know how many of you caught it. There was a huge bail another bailout of the bankers inside that cromnibus bill. There are many people today, because of the extent of our welfare mentality, now we're in several generations of that, that actually believe it's the government's job to take care of them. It's the government's job to feed them. It's the government's job to give them health care. It's the government's job to give them food and shelter. No, that's not the government's job. But the government's job is to recognize the right and liberty and life that we have been granted by our Creator. And to recognize the protection of that life and of those liberties is the proper role of government. Can you imagine in this so-called Christian nation At least it's the nation that has the largest number of Christians within it. It's not going to be the case very much longer, by the way. Within the next 15 years, there will be more Christians in China than there are in the United States. There are more Christians in China today than there are communists. How about that? Uh, a lot more I'll say about that later. But at least until the next few years, this has been traditionally the nation with the largest number of Christians within it. In this country, there is no, no, zero, nada, nothing, protection for unborn children. None. There is more protection for the spotted owl and the wolves than there are for unborn babies. All kinds of animal species have federal protection. You could go to jail for violating the lives of an animal. But an unborn baby has no legal protection in this country. A mother and a doctor can conspire together to murder that little unborn child and there is no legal repercussion whatsoever. How did the Supreme Court reach the conclusion in 1973 that it would be lawful to kill unborn babies? Well, the only way they could do it was they had to rule that babies in the womb were non-persons and therefore not deserving of the protection of living human beings. That kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? If you know your history, back in 1857, there was another Supreme Court decision that kind of said the same thing. The Dred Scott decision in 1857 said black people were not persons and therefore could be bought and sold as chattel. Well, you couldn't do that if they were real people, if they were human beings. 
And so the Supreme Court in 1857 said, well, they're just not people. They're not human beings. Therefore, they have no natural right to liberty. In 1973, the Supreme Court used the same reasoning, this time applying it to unborn children of any race, saying they're non-persons, therefore they do not have the natural right of life. I hear so many people in the pro-choice so-called movement say, well, it's a woman's body. She has the right to control it. Well, she has the right to control her body. There's no doubt about that. The problem is that little baby in her womb is not her body. It's the body of her child, a living soul created uniquely in the image of God. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who was the director of the largest abortionary, abortion clinic, abortuary, in the United States for many, many years in New York City. Dr. Nathanson is not a Christian to my knowledge. And when he, read, when he wrote the book that I read, he, he wasn't a Christian and he wasn't even approaching it from that perspective. But he wrote a book entitled Aborting America. If you've never read it, it's a book you really need to read. Aborting America by Dr. Bernard Nathanson. It's been around for a long time. You can find it on Amazon. It's paperback very cheaply. It's a profoundly important book. This is a man that had superintended over all of these abortions for so many years and then scientifically, medically, came to realize that these were living beings. These were human beings in the womb. Back in 1973, we did not have the medical advancement that we have today. And many people did not really understand it, though they should have if they had known the scripture. Dr. Nathanson was one of those men, but when he recognized medically what was going on with an abortion, he wrote that book to try and warn America as to what was really happening. And here's a quote from that book. He said, there is no doubt that human life exists within the womb from the very onset of pregnancy. A quote from Dr. Bernard Nathanson. Dr. Millard Jefferson, who is a surgeon at the Boston University Medical Center, diplomat of the American Board of Surgery with many, many honors and awards, wrote this. Many people try to hide behind the confusion of not knowing what happens before a baby is born. But we do not have to be confused. We in medicine and science have a different name for every stage of the development of the baby. But it does not matter at all whether you know those names or not. When a young woman has not had much opportunity to go to school and she becomes pregnant, no one has to tell her that she's going to have a baby. I became a doctor in the tradition that is represented in the Bible of looking upon medicine as a high calling. I will not stand aside and have this great profession of mine of the doctor give up the designation of healer to become that of social executioner. And we're seeing this carry over now, not just in abortion, but in many other areas of life where that we're going to be asking the doctor to not be the healer, but the social executioner of our country. Shades of Nazi Germany. I will not stand aside and have this great profession of mine of the doctor give up the designation of healer to become that of social executioner. The Supreme Court justices only had to hand down an order. Social workers only have to make arrangements. But it's been given to my profession to destroy the life of the innocent and the helpless. Today, 
It is the unborn child. Tomorrow, it is likely to be the elderly and those who are incurably ill. Who knows, but that a little later, it may be anyone who has political or moral views that do not fit the distorted new order. To that question, am I my brother's keeper, I answer yes. It is everyone's responsibility to safeguard and preserve life. A child is a member of the human family and deserves care and concern. Dr. Mildred Jefferson. Amen. Do you know they are already talking about with the implementation of Obamacare? They are already talking about, and they laughed at Sarah Palin back whenever she was talking about this in 2008. They're talking now, they're talking seriously now because of the high cost of medical care that are going to be directly associated with Obamacare that they all know is inevitable. They're talking about selective treatment. They're already talking about it. They're already talking about, yeah, you know what, there might come a time when a bureaucrat representing Obamacare will decide whether or not it is financially worth giving this person medical assistance. They're already talking about it. It's, it's not a giant step from that to the death squads whereby certain people are considered to be unfit for society and therefore can be taken at the will of the state. This has been going on in the USSR for decades. This has been going on in China for decades. Germany during the Nazi years. In China, they, in, in, in the bigger cities of China, they have a one-child policy. And if you dare to defy the, the state and secretly deliver that child upon discovery, that child will be summarily executed by the state authorities. And now, after many decades of this insane policy, not to mention ungodly atheistic policy, doesn't recognize life as being the created act of God, and of course, the communists are atheists who don't even believe in God, therefore they don't believe in anything that God would create. The female population in China is, is reduced to the point that it's difficult for the young Chinese men to find wives. Because so many of the Chinese families, knowing they can only have one child, they choose to have a boy so they can carry on the family name. And so all the little girls that are in the wombs are summarily executed for the good of the state. And you can talk to Chinese people today, many of them, and they will tell you, oh yeah, this is, this is for the good of the state. <laughs> Professor L.R. Agnew of the UCLA School of Medicine posed this scenario to his class. He said, students, here is the family history. The father has syphilis. The mother has tuberculosis. They have four children. The first child is blind. Second child already died. The third child is deaf. The fourth child has tuberculosis, tuberculosis and she is currently carrying her fifth child. They are willing to abort if you say so, what say you? And given the general ideology of our country today, most of the students in his class will say, abort! To which Dr. Agnew responds, congratulations class, you just murdered Beethoven.
But the important matter is not Beethoven's talent, but it's Beethoven's life. The issue is not the talent or the intelligence or the gift. The matter, the issue is the life of the individual. How many musicians, doctors, astronauts, teachers, businessmen and women, generals, governors, pastors, missionaries, Sunday school teachers, housewives have been killed for reasons less difficult than that of Beethoven's. Somebody said, well, what about cases involving rape? Well, while we are talking about maybe 1% of all of the pregnancies that occur, consider this case history. A 12-year-old black girl was raped and became pregnant. Abort? If you say yes, you just agreed to kill Ethel Waters. The second important point that Dr. Jefferson raises is where does abortion lead? Well, I think we know where it has led. We are there. We were shocked a few years ago. This was many years ago now, back in the 80s. When we heard about infant doe in Bloomington, Indiana, some of you are old enough to remember this. A little baby was born in Bloomington, Indiana with Down's syndrome. The parents, after seeing the baby had Down's upon birth, made a conscious decision with the doctors in the hospital to do nothing to care for the baby, including feeding it, and let the baby die. It was a conscious decision by the parents and the doctors in that hospital to let that baby die. The fancy word for this, folks, is infanticide. It didn't take very long. I don't know if it was hours or a day or so, but somebody in the media found out about what was going on in the Bloomington Hospital. Here were parents and doctors that were deliberately choosing not to care, not to feed for a new ba newborn baby because it had down. It was going to die. It was went all over. It went viral all over the the media of the United States. Phone calls, faxes began to flood the hospital. Do not let that baby die. We will gladly adopt that child. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of couples around the country begged for the life of that little baby. They would love to have that little baby. There are many, many tens of thousands of families in our country that would give almost anything to be able to have a baby, even if it had Down syndrome. But of course, we're talking about a bureaucratic situation. And by the time any kind of a bureaucratic answer was to be rendered, the little baby starved to death. How could people even think such a thing? Ronald Reagan's book that I, we have on the table back there that you need to get, Abortion and the Conscience of the Nation. The Conscience of the Nation. What kind of a conscience could people have or not have that would let a little baby starve to death simply because it wasn't perfect? 
conscience of a nation. More than the tens of millions of little innocent babies that have been killed over the last 40 some odd years is the, the searing of the conscience of our country where that we no longer value life as life, as a gift of God. The lack of understanding and appreciation for life as a philosophy has been seared by the acceptance of abortion on demand. I wonder how many of our pastors across America have ever walked in a picket line in an abortion clinic. How many of them have ever lobbied a legislative body? You know, back in the 70s and 80s, you might could say you were pro-life as an organization nationally and as a, as, a, as a politician, and you might could fool people with that. This is over 40 years, folks. 40 years of Republicans, 40 years of Democrats, 40 years of Republican justices, 40 years of Democrat justices, 40 years of Republican presidents, 40 years of Democrat presidents, 40 years of Republican Congresses, 40 years of Democrat Congresses, and not one single little unborn baby has been saved by their efforts. The Republican Party, the so-called pro-life party, control the entire federal government, president, Congress, Senate, Supreme Court for four long years from 2002 to 2006. They had every opportunity to overturn Roe versus Wade and they did nothing. But then on election time, they come back home to the constituents and say, vote for me. I'm pro-life. Barf! If you were pro-life Republican Party in Washington, D.C., you could have gotten rid of Roe v. Wade years and years and years ago. You are phonies! They don't care any more about ending Roe v. Wade and overturning Roe v. Wade than the Democrat Party does. And as far as the National Right to Life organization in D.C., it is a joke. We have been sold out and betrayed time and time and time again by these national pro-life so-called leaders in Washington, D.C. They're the ones that often undermine the good pro-life bills that people like Jerry O'Neill and others at the state and national level would try to introduce. Dr. Ron Paul, every session, would present his Sanctity of, of Human Life bill to the Congress. And every year, it would sit in the Rayburn building in the document room there and collect dust. And never did the Republicans bring it to the floor for a vote. Unborn babies have not had very many friends in Washington, D.C., of either party ever since Roe v. Wade was decided. Now, with all this time gone by, you can't even get a pastor to even broach the topic in his pulpit on Sunday. God bless America? Really? The real issue is the respect for life. In a book that was written years ago by Dr. Schaefer and 
C. Everett Koop, who of course was a Surgeon General of the United States for seven years under Ronald Reagan, wrote a book called Whatever Happened to the Human Race? And they, they mentioned this. The Declaration of Geneva adopted in September 1948 by the General Assembly of the World Medical Association and modeled closely to the Hippocratic Oath became used as the graduation oath by graduates of our medical schools. It includes, I quote, I will maintain the utmost respect for, hum for human life from the time of conception, close quote. That's been the philosophy of our medical community until Roe v. Wade. It was the philosophy of our nation. It was the heartbeat. It was the conscience of our country. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life from the time of conception. We no longer respect life. And the problem is, we're so far into this that now it's, it's maturated into more than unborn children and even more than infanticide and more than genetic engineering and all these terrible and weird things that the scientific community are trying to normalize in our country and trying to convince us is natural and, oh, nothing wrong with any of this. This is just part of being a society. It's even worse than that. The, the conscience of the Christian community has been seared. You know, disagree in secondary doctrine and the nuances of theology and all the things that the conscience of the country has pretty much been predicated upon the heart and the soul of the Christian community. If the Christians don't care, if the Christians' hearts are cold, if the conscience of Christians are seared, who's going to fill the void? Who's going to step up to the nation and say, wait a minute, We've lost our bearings. We've lost our mooring. Where, where are we going? Where is our heart? Where is our, our respect for the laws of our Creator? And unfortunately today, things have gotten so out of kilter that many times you find non-Christians that seem to have a clearer conscience than even some that call themselves Christians. And I confess it boggles the mind, but it's true. I see it time and time and time again. Talk to the average pastor and you might as well talk to that wall. But there are people out there, even people outside the Christian community, who see these things and their eyes are awakened and they seem to have a greater sensitivity of heart and conscience than even the people that sit in the pews of our churches. I got a rude awakening in 2008 when I was campaigning around the country. And I got to see all over America, the mood of the Christian people in this country. And it scared me then and it scares me more now. I watched in horror as Congressman Ron Paul stood on the platform in Columbia, South Carolina and made a simple, what should have been commonly accepted statement, especially in light of the audience in which he was speaking, there are probably more Christians per square mile in the state of South Carolina than any other state in the Union. Yeah, don't ask me why they keep electing Lindsey Graham. That
Dr. Paul made a basic, simple statement. Why don't we try putting Christ's great commission to us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to try and implement that into our foreign policy. And he was practically booed off the stage by Christians. John McCain gets up, bomb, 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 Iran, bomb, 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 Iran, and all the Christians stand and cheer. I tell you how Lindsey Graham gets elected again and again in South Carolina. He's a warmonger. And so are most Christians in America today. It gives me no pleasure to say it. But it's true. We are war mongers. We are bloodthirsty people. Christianity is growing fastest in places of the of the world that you and I would probably not think twice about on my website I posted a, a, a an article and I think I even mentioned it in a column a week or two ago about how fast the churches are growing in China and within 15 years there'll be more Christians in China than there are in the United States of America Christianity on the whole is on the wane in America. Christianity becomes less every year in our country. We're not even keeping up with the population. Our churches are in decline all across the country. The only churches that are really blossoming for the most part are the entertainment oriented, the Joel Olstein feel good type churches. They're the only ones that are growing. Everybody else is losing members. If it continues to go on, this, fewer people claim to be Christian in America today than any time in our history. While in China, Christianity is growing exponentially. And you know what the reports are saying about that? You know why the churches are growing in, in, in China? The churches that are growing in China are, they don't use the same terminology different legal structure, but to give it verbiage that we can understand, the churches that are growing in China are all of them, every single one of them, non-501c3 churches. Every one of them. They are underground churches. They are non-state approved churches. They are illegal many times illegal churches they meet in secret they meet in hiding and they are growing by leaps and bounds what do we have in America we have state churches IRS churches government churches and what's happening to them they're dying why? Because the church cannot serve Christ and Caesar at the same time. That's why. The churches in China recognize the lordship of Christ and they're willing to go to prison for it. And they're willing to die for it. And they're mushrooming all over the country. The communist dictators in China are really worried about the growth of Christianity. Like I said, they now know there's more Christians than there are communists in China. What are they going to do about it? They're really worried about it. I guarantee you Washington, D.C. is not worried about any of the churches in the United States of America. 
Because they're under the control of the IRS. They got their thumb on the pastors behind the pulpits, scared to death that they might lose their tax-exempt status. So they avoid subjects like abortion. But wait a minute. If we are really right to life, are not people who are born just as precious in the eyes of God as people who are unborn? How is it that we can have this, all this emotional feeling about the right to life that some people like to say they have, even though there's not a substance to it for the most part, and then turn around and get all gushy about killing people halfway around the world? You know, it's not enough that we have bombers from aircraft carriers that go and, and drop bombs on so often innocent people. What was it Madeleine Albright said? 100,000 innocent casualties? 500,000? Was that the figure she used? 500,000 deaths of innocent casualties in, in Iraq was well worth it. Really? Ms. Albright? But now then with technology, we've got guys who play a video game and kill people with a peanut butter sandwich and a Coca-Cola sitting at the desk next to them. They're called drones. It's like these kids that play video games killing everybody on the video game, except this is real. And these are real people with real death and real blood and real families and real casualties. Not only is Christianity growing fast in China, Christianity is growing fast in Palestine. When I visited the Middle East, several years ago and had the opportunity at that time to speak to the only two Baptist churches in Israel. I'm not sure what it is now, but at that time there were only two. One was in Jerusalem and the other was in Bethlehem. And I preached in both of them. Maybe I told you this recently. Hey, I'm over 50, I can forget. I can, I can repeat stories. Oh. Problem. I was shocked. Ninety-five percent of the Christians in each of those churches were Palestinians. They're Palestinians. I hear I hear preachers get up and talk about annihilating the Palestinians. I hear preachers get up and talk about bombing the Palestinians. Well, one of the biggest problems in the world is that America won't leave well enough alone. And we've got a State Department in Washington, D.C. that is more concerned about establishing a new world order than they are protecting the lives and the property of the people of the United States of America. There's no one that believes in the right of self-defense any more than I do. There's no one that I think who understands the biblical concept of the defense of life than I do. The Bible says there is a time to kill. And when your life is threatened, your family is threatened, imminent danger, 
You have a God-given duty to defend the life that God has given to you, even if it means the forfeiting of the life of the perpetrator. That is a God-given duty. And that applies nationally as well. As a nation, we have a right to defend ourselves. Absolutely. We don't have a right to be the world's policemen. And we don't have the right to exert our political will over another country just because we don't like whoever the tin horn happens to be who's in charge. And then take him out and replace him with another tin horn who most of the times is about ten times worse than the tin horn that we got rid of to begin with. Can anybody say Saddam Hussein? From a persecution standpoint, the government in Iraq today is ten times worse than anything Saddam Hussein ever had in Iraq. Christians were thriving in Iraq. The Christian church was wherever we're in Iraq. There was tolerance and religious liberty in Iraq before 2003 when George W. Bush decided to invade that country unlawfully. Put in the puppet regime that's been there since. And what happens to the Christian population in Iraq? It's almost not existent. Churches are not existent. Christians have fled the country. There are almost none left. But you got Lindsey Graham and John McCain and all these other neocon Republicans calling for blood all the time perpetual state of war. We have been in a perpetual state of war ever since World War II ended and the United Nations was created. Tear down those yellow ribbons, folks, because they're never coming home. Over 150 military bases around the world, we've got people, now, now then, you know, that paper came and said the other day that we've got a shortage of drone pilots, and so now we're going to go into the National Guard and to the state units and, and, and recruit more drone pilots so that we can kill more people. I realize that these are very difficult days. And I realize that it's a very dangerous world. I understand that. I also understand that we have people in power that do not have the best interests of the citizens of our country or even the sovereignty of our country in mind, but that in fact are using, are using the brave men and women that are patriotic and trying to do their duty to our country for their own parochial, devilish purposes. But where's the conscience of the nation? Where are the Christians to stand for the principles of Christ that include the principles of love and grace, the respect for life, we value liberty so much in America that we say a man is innocent until he's proven guilty. And we lay a whole bunch of very complicated and convoluted procedures in place to make the state prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this person is guilty before we take his liberty from him. That's how much we value liberty. That's the way it's supposed to be. And same with life. We value life. You put barriers and safeguards in place and you make sure that before we take the life of this person, that it's absolutely necessary and right in the eyes of God. 
You see what I'm talking about? See what abortion has done? It's not just the unborn. It seared our conscience about life itself. And folks, if somehow, some way, the church doesn't respond to this, if somehow, some way, the men of God don't respond to this, if somehow, some way, we don't again, once, once again, begin to elevate the preciousness of liberty and the preciousness of life, we're going to lose both. And we are. It was a sad day, January 22nd, 1973. I'll close with this. When I was pastoring in Florida, I had a radio program. And through the radio program, a police lieutenant for the city police department visited our church and I had the privilege of winning him to the Lord and he he got excited about the Lord and he was a new Christian and he was a lieutenant so he, you know his word was pretty powerful down there at the police department and he started preaching to those guys He'd have me come in down there. He'd get all the officers together. He'd have me come in and preach to them. And I'd do that once in a while. And then he'd, 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 he'd call me up. He'd say, hey, come ride with me. He, w he wasn't a patrolman, of course. He's a lieutenant. He was a, he was a supervisor of a, sh of a shift. But he'd say, come ride with me. So he'd pick me up in his squad car, and we'd drive around. And he just wanted he just wanted to talk about the Lord, and he wanted to ask me questions about Jesus and about the Bible. And, you know, he was just a, a little bird, you know, as a, like a new Christian that couldn't get enough. So we'd drive around in his squad car, and in between his business, we'd talk about the Lord and everything. And one day a call came in. There was a man that was attempting suicide. Policemen were right. This is... This is back before the days when our police were more like military soldiers than they are peace officers. Today, anything happened. You got 20 or 30 SWAT guys dressed head to foot with Kevlar. And if it wasn't an explosive situation before, it will be after they show up. Didn't have that back in those days. So, guy was going to commit suicide. S squad cars were responding. Lieutenant gunned his car. Let's go. So he got there just about the same time a couple other policemen showed up. And he got out of the squad car and he yelled at the other officers. He said, stay back, stay back. Everybody stay back. And he said, preacher, come on. And so I walk with the guy, and as we're walking toward the man with the gun, he's distraught, depressed. The lieutenant's telling him, this is my pastor. Just hold it. Hold on a minute. You don't want to kill yourself, because if you die, you're going to go to hell. Hang on a minute. By the way, we don't think about that, do we? You know, whenever people die, it's either heaven or hell. Come on, folks. This is forever. You don't want to do that. Listen to this man. He helped, he helped me, man. I'm telling you, he got me straightened out. He can help you get straightened out. Come on over here. Before I know it, I'm there nose to nose with this guy. And I told him, hey, man, you're special to God. 
You don't feel it right now. I don't know what all your problems are. I know you don't feel special. But God created you in his image and his likeness. He knew you from the time you were in the womb of your mother. He loves you. He sent his son to die for you. You're special to God. There's no problem you have that God can't help you with. And I talked to him like that just for a couple minutes. And almost in no time, he put the gun on the ground, tears streaming down his face, and the police lieutenant on one side and me on the other, and we took him to the squad car, took him off and got him some professional help. I had the privilege of winning that man to Christ a few days later, and as far as I know, he's still serving the Lord today. It doesn't always turn out that way. I know that. But when we lose our respect for life, we've lost our conscience. And when we lose our conscience, we'll lose our country. Let's all stand for prayer.